14 minutes past eight is time now. Saturday morning, hope the sun is shining where you are. Let's check in with our regulars, Professor Linda Bold and Dr Chris Smith. They're here with us every Saturday to help us understand the latest developments in the coronavirus pandemic. Good morning to you both. Good morning. Good morning. Got you up an hour earlier today. How's that feel? Feels a bit odd? Yeah, the coffee well, has not week. kicked in yet. <laughs> <laughs> now, first of all, shall we all say congratulations to Linda? Um, you've been made an OBE in the Queen's Birthday Honours List. Congratulations. Um, how did it feel when you got the letter? Or the email, no, it was actually? A, yeah, it, well, it was an email, that's right. Nowadays, it's all digital. It was a real surprise, Naga. I had no idea. And I just think so many thousands of people um, have been working incredibly hard in public health, specifically my field, along with many others during the last 14 months. So it's just wonderful to see recognition, not just of, of me, I'm very grateful, but also as you've been covering in the programme, so many other brilliant colleagues. So yeah, I'm just absolutely chuffed, thrilled. And uh, Chris, I mean, clearly it, it could be a postal issue or something, but uh, <laughs> I, I, I'm trying to get over the awkward bit here. Anything we want to say to Linda about her award? Oh, congratulations. So Massive congratulations. And, and as Linda says, it's really terrific to see the life sciences sector get the recognition that it has. Talking to, to my friends and colleagues who work in universities and healthcare and so on, we've really seen the, the kind of emphasis placed on science and what science and medicine can do across the COVID pandemic. And it has resulted in a lot of support from the public for, for what scientists do in their efforts. And I think it's really pushed the science forward, especially from an investment point of view, but also a recognition point of view. And I, and I think that puts us in a really strong place going forward because we will see more people because of this applying to university to do sciences because they'll see that, that science actually can really change the world that we live in. And it's, it's a great time to be a scientist. So I'm really pleased to see so much recognition of the people who have, and Britain is at the forefront of all of this, who've, who've actually helped to, to get us out of the mess that we've, we've ended up in. So yeah. massive congratulations, Linda. Well done. Yeah, but we, we, you, all, we all very much echo that here as well, uh, Linda. So can I, first, first up, Linda, can I, can I ask you a question in relation to what's going to happen next? And it's all the talk around June 21st, isn't it, and possible relaxations and those factors that are significant. Can you, the, in amongst them, and I know they're not necessarily graded this way, but the issue around hospitalizations and deaths is I think maybe paramount, but what's certainly one of the significant figures. Well, what we're seeing, Charlie, in general, is that uh, we're not experiencing exactly the same thing as we did in 2020 or at the beginning of this year. The number of people on average being admitted to hospital compared to infections is about half of what it was. So that's really, really positive. Um, and those are the main indicators that the government will be looking at, the proportion of people in hospital and the proportion of people in ICU. And just looking at the figures yesterday, there were 32 new admissions to hospital with COVID. Let's remember there are over 50,000 hospital admissions every day in England. And for example, about 600 of those would be for bowel cancer, maybe even more in a single day. So we are looking at small numbers, but the but in all of this is with the Delta variant, with the data released this week, we now know the transmissibility is about 60% more than alpha. Um, if we have, if we allow that to rip through the population and more people become infected and some of them have not been vaccinated, that could really push those hospital numbers up. And that's why many people are calling for a slight pausing or maybe slowing down to that big reopening that was planned on June the 21st. Uh, Chris, um, one of the things that um, has been of concern, and it's something we used to talk about all the time. In other words, if I've got coronavirus, how many new cases do I cause? And so if the R number is greater than one, then you are increasing the scale of the outbreak. So one's the critical number. If it's less than one, then the outbreak is going away, it is shrinking. It doesn't mean it instantly vanishes, it just means that day after day it gets smaller. So the fact that we've seen an uptick above one argues that the seesaw has tipped and it's tipped away from being in our favour to being in coronavirus's favour of a bigger outbreak. It doesn't mean we've instantly got big numbers, but it means if we carry on that way, we will see numbers increasing. And what the government will be considering is that come June the 21st, if we carry on at the trajectory of growth of the outbreak we're at, we will have 15 to 20,000 cases per day, 1,000 cases per day that we know about become casualties. 
at the moment, as Linda's just said, the number of people going into hospital is low and the number of admissions, we've got 150,000 beds in the NHS. The number occupied by people who have got coronavirus is fewer than 1,000. So it's less than 1%. It's very, very low at the moment, but that doesn't mean that can't change quite dramatically. Summer coming, more people being outdoors more often, and people going back to work, all these factors to work out what we can tolerate in terms of cases and whether those cases are translating into casualties. And said, there's been success in dealing with places like that that have those particular problems, like what happened in Bolton. And they use Bolton as an example of a place where surge vaccine, surge testing worked. Now, what's your understanding of what was achieved in Bolton and did it work? I think it did work. So you're right, just back to the hot spots, you can see very clearly there's two things we're concerned about in some parts of the country. High rates of infection, particularly with the Delta variant, which we think is now about 96% of cases in the UK. And secondly, low rates of vaccine uptake. For example, in London, of all people in the population, only about a third have had a second dose compared to over 40% of the whole population in the UK. So those two things in combination cause concern. And you're right, it's the Northwest, it's London, some other parts we've had issues, as you know, in Glasgow, etc. So what happened in Bolton was surge testing, finding cases, getting on top of them, um, support for self-isolation, so, uh, so testing large numbers of people, and then, as you say, accelerating the vaccine rollout. And that does seem to have worked. Now, Bolton had high proportion of the Delta variant cases, largely in younger people. We really need to focus resources on those areas where we do see concern. So it looks like that approach works. But as Chris said a minute ago, if we then have the whole country with lots of infection, we can't do that targeted approach anymore. And we must avoid that. Chris, just a quick word. I mean, it's something we've spoken about. We spoke with our GP this morning. We've spoken about the last couple of weeks as well. Uh there are lots of cases of coronavirus and there are lots of cases of coronavirus where people have no symptoms at all. Maybe a third to a half of people will have such trivial symptoms or no symptoms and they do nothing about it. So you've got to look at the number that we see of cases and, and probably double it to get the reality. But what you can't argue with of people ending up in hospital and that's a sensitive measure and that's low at the moment and this is why the government are in a quandary because on the one hand we do have cases we do have escalating case rates but we don't have that translating into hospitalizations at the moment but we must be cautious because it takes time between people catching the infection more people catching the infection and becoming sufficiently unwell to end up in hospital because the youngest members of society have been the last to be vaccinated they're also the best networked in society they're more likely to have more contacts with more other people more of the time and that's how you transmit the infection so it's unsurprising that we're seeing activity of the disease in those groups and that's one of the arguments for why actually when we have the capacity to do so going in and vaccinating that group will actually really help to keep the caseload down in the future OBE, thank you very much, and uh, Chris Smith as, as well. Thanks. Pleasure. Oh, stop it. <laughs> so bad. I'd, I'm, when we can we bring them back get, up? I am Chris. Uh, are we okay? We're, we're right. I'm, you understand why I'm doing that? It's not a, we all understand. It's just one of those things. Yes? You see, he's ignoring you now. There you go. There you go. That told you. Here we go. It's Dr. Chris Smith, uh, just for the record, Dr. Chris Smith, virologist. He'll be back next week alongside Professor Linda Bold. He might be back next week. Charlie might not. Um, Matt has the weather for us. <laughs> not like Charlie to upset anyone, is it, Matt? Morning. <laughs> not at all. Lovely. Anyway, very good morning to you both. Uh, going in and vaccinating that group will actually really help to keep the caseload down in the future. And that's been another big argument this week, of course, uh, and, and the week before about whether or not we should be vaccinating children between the ages of 12 and 16, as well as younger adults. Professor Linda Bald, OBE, thank you very much. And uh, Chris Smith as, as well. Thanks. Pleasure. Oh, stop it. <laughs> so bad. I'd, I'm, when we can we bring them back get, up? I am Chris. Uh, are we okay? We're, we're right. I'm, you understand why I'm doing that? It's not a. We all understand. It's just one of those things. Yes. You see, he's ignoring you now. There you go. There you go. That told you. Here we go. It's Dr. Chris Smith. Uh, just for the record, Dr. Chris Smith, virologist. He'll be back next week alongside Professor Linda Bold. He might be back next week, Charlie might not. Um, Matt has the weather for us. <laughs> not like Charlie to upset anyone, is it, Matt? Morning. <laughs> not at all. Lovely. Anyway, very good morning to you both.